1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26, it reads, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was to be betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This morning, I want to give you a simple warning. Always look both ways before you take the Lord's Supper. In the same way, we are warned to look first. At, well, as we, as we grew up, we were always taught by our parents to look both ways before we cross the street for oncoming traffic or vehicles. The Apostle Paul warned the Christians in Corinth also, eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord. In a, if you do this in an unworthy manner, you'll be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. If I could paraphrase this, look both ways before you eat and drink. Look upward in reverence, fear, and respect. Then look inward. See yourself clearly. Check for pride and any evil in you. If you don't look both ways, you are guilty of yet another sin and you will surely die. This is this is no part this is part of our worship that brings us closest to heaven is communion. Its blessing is lost, but if but if we don't look before we cross. Let's pray. Lord, this morning I, I pray that we might have clear hearts and that we can look to you of what you prepared for us and that we can remain faithful to you as we take this communion. I pray that, that we might become closer to you and live a life according to how you lived. And when, that we can try to be an imitation of you. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.
morning. Glad you all were able to make it today, and if you're watching online later, then we're glad you're uh, able to watch that. Uh, we are just happy that we can still worship together uh, in this time. Um, I want to start off today with a little bit of a uh, audience participation, okay? And uh, what I want you to do is have a little show of hands. And so I want you to raise your hands. I'm going to ask a series of questions. And just raise your hands if this is true or has happened to you. So raise your hand if you have ever committed a sin or wrongdoing. Hopefully everyone's hand is up because, uh, let's face it, we've all sinned. <laughs> um, how about raise your hand if you've ever been confronted about a mistake or shortcoming? This could be by a friend or a parent or even some just random stranger on the street. Yep, okay. Now raise your hand if you've ever not handled someone correcting you well. <laughs> or and raise your hand if you've ever had to talk to someone else about a sin or mistake that they've made. I think for the most part, if you looked around, you realize that pretty much every hand was up on almost every single one of those. And that's why I think this passage that we are reading, if you really read the subtext behind everything, is so important. And so go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, where we're going to spend a little bit of time today. And we're going to talk a little bit about this issue of uh, correcting people and being corrected. And so uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 through 10, if you don't have your Bibles on you, it'll be up on the screen behind me. Starting in verse 8, it says, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that your letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So, this passage kind of constructs this area of what correction should bring. So this letter that Paul is talking about, he was writing a letter, and he had to correct the Corinthians on some of their actions, some of their behavior, and what they were doing. And so he acknowledges that it caused grief amongst them. And at first he was bothered by it. But then after a while he realized that it actually produced what he wanted it to produce, which was godly grief. And so there's this kind of formula that uh, comes about. And that formula is, it starts with correction, which hopefully will produce godly grief, which will then produce repentance, which will then produce salvation. Because the Bible says in Hebrews that if we continually live within a sin and that sin starts taking over us, then we have an option of losing the salvation that we have because we now are succumbed completely to sin. And so Paul is saying that sometimes people need correction. Sometimes people need correction to guarantee that we can produce in them repentance of those sins that they are committing so that way salvation can be grasped. And so this is what we see here. And so what I want to spend the majority of our time on today, though, is kind of addressing the two different parties involved today. And so we have Paul, who is the corrector, and then we have the Corinthian church, which is the corrected. And so what I want to do is break each one of those down and kind of go into a little more detail about each party. And so first one, we have the corrector. And in this case, again, like I said earlier, it was Paul, and he wrote a letter to the Corinthian church to point out some of the things that they were doing that they shouldn't be doing. But sometimes, if we're honest, and I saw pretty much everyone's hand here up, we have to correct people. There are times where we have to call someone out, so to speak, or talk to them about behavior or sin in their life, because sometimes that is our responsibility as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, that we have to talk to someone about what, they are, what is going on in their life. However, it's important when we do this that we follow the biblical guidelines of it. Now, this may take place as church discipline, which Jesus talks about that in Matthew. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians a little bit. 
and a little bit in 2 Corinthians earlier in the book, and where we have to make sure that we're doing things the right way. And it means that we first confront someone's sin if they're not willing to repent of it then. Then we bring someone along with us, and if they're still not willing to repent of it, then we get the elders involved in talking to that person. Because we want to make sure that they understand the gravity of their sin. However, it's important that we remember the words uh, in Ephesians where it talks about that whenever we do confront someone, that we speak the truth in love. It should always come from a loving place. It's also important to note that Paul is writing to a church, and whenever Jesus is talking, he's talking about correcting other believers. In fact, Jesus even says in the Sermon on the Mount that what good is it to correct those that are already lost? What good is it to judge those that are not believing? Because they're already judged because they don't know Jesus. And so the correction that we have to give is not to unbelievers telling them that they're sinners, because of course they're sinners because they don't know Jesus. The correction that Paul is talking about here and what he had to do is because they were believers in Christ. They were fellow church people that had wandered astray and needed correction in their life so they didn't go too far down that road. And so when we're called to judge people and we're called to uh, correct people, the correction and judgment that we are called to do is to those that are believers. You see, our responsibility to unbelievers, Paul already addressed in the last couple chapters. Our responsibility to unbelievers is the ministry of reconciliation, which we've talked about. Our responsibility to unbelievers is not to judge them, but to help reconcile them to God. And so the people outside the church, they don't need us to tell them where they're wrong. They need us to show them the love of Christ so they can come to a relationship with him. And then once they form a relationship with him, hopefully then they'll love him and start to want to do what he wants them to do. And so that's what our responsibility is to unbelievers. But to believers, it is our responsibility sometimes to correct the wrongdoings because we want to make sure they stay on the path to God. And so it's very important to note the motivation of the corrector. It's very important to notice the motivation that Paul had. And his motivation was always that they would turn back to God. You see, his motivation, and just like our motivation should be whenever we correct others, should always be out of love to produce repentance. It should always be out of love. I referenced earlier that Ephesians said, speak the truth in love, and there's a second part of that. And that second part is that they would then be built up in love. You see, the problem is truth is good, but truth in the wrong way can sometimes tear people down. But truth in love builds people up and grows them closer to God. And so we need to make sure that the motivation and how we're presenting that truth is in a loving way. And to be completely honest, if you love someone, you will correct them. It's part of loving them because you care about where their eternal destination is. And so you want to make sure that they are doing the right thing. And so you will correct them out because you love them. But you want to make sure you're careful how you do it. It's just like when you're a parent. Sometimes you have to correct in different ways to produce different results. Um, but often uh, you have to be careful that they actually understand why you're correcting them. That they just don't see your anger, but they also see the love in the truth. Now, that doesn't mean don't discipline. That's not what I'm saying. But they need to know that you care enough, and that's why you're doing it. That's why you're produce, doing the correction, so that way, hopefully, they'll actually want to do what you're asking them to do. And it's the same way when we're correcting someone within the church. Sometimes we have to be careful how we're doing it and the, med, the mode in which we're doing it, because we want to make sure they know that we care about them enough that we're talking to them, so they'll actually want to change. And so Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 actually says that uh, when we restore someone that's caught in sin, that we need to do so with a spirit of gentleness. And I think that fits really well with Ephesians chapter 4 when it's talking about truth and love. Sometimes we can be a little too harsh with our truth. And sometimes the unintended consequence of that is that we actually push people away rather than bring them closer to God. And so we have to be careful about the mode in which we do it. 
We also have to be careful that our motivation is not uh, pushed by our selfishness or selfish desires. <laughs> because sometimes we want to correct people because they are more annoying us than we actually want to see them come back to Christ. And if that's our motivation, then we're probably not going to pr- approach the truth in love. It may be true, but we're probably not going to approach that true statement and with as much love as we should because we're approaching it out of annoyance or selfishness rather than out of their well-being. And so whenever we are correcting people, we do have to look at our own lives first. We have to look within ourselves first before we correct them to make sure that we're doing these things for the right reason. And then we have to think through how are we correcting someone so they know that we love them and we want to see them grow closer to God. And that's the important thing. And I think Paul takes that approach. Paul deals harsh truth in a lot of his letters. But I think if you read Paul's letters, you never doubt the affection that Paul has for the churches. You never doubt how much he cares for them. That doesn't stop him from revealing those hard truths. It just means he's careful about how he does so. And we need to follow that same approach. However, just like when we did the raising of hands, we see that sometimes we need to be corrected. Sometimes we are the corrected, not the corrector. And if we're being honest, this probably just wasn't when we were children. Probably as adults, we have needed correction at some point in our adulthood. And we've needed somebody, whether it was a spouse or a friend or a parent still, telling us, you're not going down the right path. You need to be careful what you're doing because it's not the way you should be doing it. And so sometimes when we're being corrected, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to be corrected. But the fact remains that we need to do, be corrected sometimes. And so the question is, is how are you going to react? How are you going to react to correction? And it's important to think about that. Because sometimes we don't react well to correction. Sometimes we act with anger or frustration And we snap back or we get defensive rather than actually taking the correction. I know for me, I'm guilty of this. There are times that uh, at the very beginning, I don't take correction well. And a lot of times during these times, I have time, a little bit of time to think about it later. And I normally have to apologize to the person because I realized they were just trying to help me. And I was actually in the wrong for getting defensive that they didn't do anything wrong. They had every right to come to me and say I was doing something that I shouldn't be doing. And so when we're looking at this, we have to remember that when we are being corrected, we have to do so with humility, and we need to make sure that we are staying at peace with others. Because Paul says in in Romans that we should strive to live at peace with everyone, including the person who's correcting us. They are one of those everyones. And so it means that we are striving to be humble and to always say that they are probably coming about it in a good way. And so in that, we assume the best out of the corrector. We don't assume that they have false motives. We assume that they are doing it out of love, not out of selfish ambition or anything like that. We assume that they are actually wanting to help us, not that they're trying to tear us down. So when a fellow member of the church comes to you and corrects you, whether it's me or someone else in the audience, know that their heart is probably in the right place. They're probably not trying to tear you down and make you feel bad about yourself. They're probably trying to make sure that you don't go too far down a road that you shouldn't be going down. And so as the corrected, we should make sure that we are assuming the best of the corrector. And we need to realize that the reason why they are correcting us is because they want to see us closer to God. They want to make sure that anything that's going to be a hindrance between us as God is repented of. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want anything between me and God. And so sometimes that means I need to be corrected. And so when a corrector comes to me, I need to have enough humility to know that maybe that's what I needed. And I think everyone in here is the same way. Unfortunately, often instead of with humility and with peace, we often react in anger and bitterness. And we get frustrated with the person. We don't want to talk to that person anymore. And I believe that this is part of that worldly grief that Paul is talking about. 
And I believe that the death that he is referring to is an eternal spiritual death. You see, when we don't take correction well, eventually that sin continues to grow in our life. Eventually new sin, like anger, which is not always a sin, but can lead to things like bitterness and other things, starts taking hold in our life. And before long, that gap between us as God is growing more and more. And so when you're unwilling to be corrected, what can eventually happen is sometimes your life gets so separated from God that you're no longer really in a relationship with him. And as we know, if we're not in a relationship with God, then there is only one place where we go in eternity. And so this spiritual death, this eternal death takes hold. Now the good news is, you can always still repent. (laughs) It's not too late it, there's always repentance available, and you can still come to God and seek forgiveness for whatever sin that's taken hold of your life. And this is what we should want. We should want our lives to be more like Christ. We should want our lives to be more aligned with God's Word. And I mean, we should welcome correction. Because none of us have it all figured out. None of us have it all perfect. And so it means that all of us will need moments of correction. It doesn't matter how spiritual you are, how long you've been on this earth, how long you've been reading your Bible and praying, there are going to be moments where you need correction. And I hope in those moments that you have someone who loves you enough that will speak the truth and love to you and correct you. Because that's what we need. And I think this passage shows that. And to be honest, this whole process of being corrected is part of the sanctification process that is part of salvation. I've talked about this before, but just lay it out for you again, just to make sure uh, that we remember and we understand is there are two aspects of salvation. There's justification and sanctification. And those are complicated church words that we don't use in most everyday life. But justification is a legal term. And it means that uh, whenever you give your life over to God, when you've repented of your sins, you've confessed Jesus Christ with uh, your lips in front of others, and whenever you've been baptized, you are justified. And that means that you are no longer held responsible for the sin that you have committed. However, there is a relational term as well, part of salvation. And that relational term is sanctification. And that is the ongoing process of living your life to be more like Christ. It's going to be lots of bumps along the road, You're never probably going to be 100% perfect. However, our striving goal is to be more and more like Christ every day. And this process is sanctification. This is the ongoing process of our salvation. It's our ongoing process of working towards our salvation, not because we're doing some work that's earning us our right. We've already been saved because of the justification that God did. But because we love him, we are striving to be sanctified. And so that means that we allow the Holy Spirit to work with it on our lives. As Romans chapter 12 talks about the renewing of our mind, being transformed by the Holy Spirit to be more and more like Christ. And as in this passage says, being willing to let fellow Christians have a role in our sanctification when they correct our wrongdoings. And so the church gathers around each other and helps sanctify one another. We help build each other up to be more and more like Christ. And I believe that that's what Paul is talking about here. He wrote a letter to the Corinthians to help them be more like Christ. To help them to understand what their role in everything was. And to understand that they needed to be closer to God. And so sometimes we have to do the same thing. And so as we close today, I want to say this. I hope that as we go forward, I hope that we will follow 2 Corinthians 7's advice. And I hope that you will be willing to be the corrector and do so in love. But I also hope that you will have the humility to be the corrected when someone has to correct you. Let us pray. Dear Father, we are grateful that we have your word 
to give us correction, and we are grateful that we have people in our lives that love us enough to show us where we may have some wrongdoings. Show us where we aren't maybe doing everything we should be doing. And I pray that we strive to grow closer and closer to you and help others do the same, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you leave today, I have a few announcements I want to make. Uh, first, I want to thank you for all the donations for the camp that you made. Um, uh, unfortunately, and fortunately, uh, the camp met this week, the camp board executive committee that uh, Don and I are on. And because of some of the legal things in the state and different things like that, they aren't going to be able to do summer camp this summer. It's just uh, because of the restrictions and everything and because they can't risk losing the insurance they have uh, because of things, they just can't feasibly do it. And so uh, they are canceling the summer camps. However, they're looking into some uh, options that were already on the schedule for the fall retreats. So they're still going to have some of those when fall happens for every age group. And they're even looking into, um, and stay tuned on this, it's not a guaranteed, but they're looking into possibly doing some day camps in August when things might uh, get a, less, a little less restrictive. And so they're hoping that that will be the case and they can do some maybe day camps um, in August. And so stay tuned to that. Jim's going to be uh, getting some, kind of an announcement video like he did before uh, where he'll go into more detail on everything and give you more information. So uh, you don't need to worry about buying any more stuff right now. The good news is the stuff that we have, uh, it doesn't really perish. And so they can use it for the fall retreat. They can use it for next summer. And so what you gave was not in vain. Um, it's still going to be used by the camp, and it's still going to be a blessing to them. And so I'm going to, in the next week or two, gather up all that stuff and take it out to the camp, and Jim will store it all out there. And so uh, I want to thank you for your participation that this church has always been a giving church uh, when we've had donations or uh, money, m- monetary donations we need or whatever it may be. Uh, so do remember the camp and be praying for them as they move forward. Um, also, I want to remind you, we have eight bo- baby bottles left back there. If you haven't grabbed a baby bottle to support Lighthouse, uh, remember they were able having to cancel their banquet this year because of everything that happened. And that was about 70% of their funding for the year comes from that banquet. And so we want to make sure that we continue to fund them and help them and support that ministry because they do a great thing and they have some great things that they are trying to do. And so we want to make sure we help with that. And so if you haven't grabbed a baby bottle, uh, please do so. I would love to have to ask for more baby bottles. We started off with 20, 12 of them are gone, but there's eight more back there. So please grab one on your way out and support that ministry. Um, And then uh, remember, if anyone asks uh, where they can catch us on uh, stuff because they're maybe uncomfortable uh, coming to church yet, we still are posting the sermon and announcements and even the communion meditations on YouTube. So that way people can still have uh, somewhat of a worship at home, um, even if they can't come here on Sunday morning. But they will be post uh, either Sunday evening or uh, at least by Monday morning. Uh, We'll get them up there. And we'll, of course, post them on Facebook as soon as we get it up on YouTube so people know. And uh, then also, if uh, you weren't able to give an offering today, you can still give. You can give on your phone through the Giveify app or... Uh, you can go on the website and click the little bright blue button at the bottom of each page. I want to thank you for coming today, and you will be dismissed after the closing song.